Uh, my name is Chris Kiebel. I have a joint appointment in history and the Jackson School of International Studies. Um, I've been teaching about Southeast Asian history and Vietnam studies for uh, nearly 20 years at UW, um, including a perennial um, class on the Vietnam Wars. Um, I also have been taking students to uh, Vietnam for more than a decade now, uh, particularly focused on the legacies of war. So my uh, student uh, groups uh, are uh, spending most of the times in central Vietnam, in Quang Thi province and in Hue, and that is in affiliation with uh, Peace Trees Vietnam. Um, uh, first of all, thanks to um, the Southeast Asia Center for um, sponsoring and uh, setting this event up for us. And here especially um, Shannon Bush, um, who is here with us, who spent much of her uh, time um, on this. Um, Adrian Alarilla, who has um, in record time created a wonderful uh, poster and has done all the advertisement, and Sarah Homer, who is also working in the Southeast Asia Center. Um, this is a, uh, the second of now two events in response to the Ken Burns uh, series. Um, the first one was in the same space here in, on October 7, um, and that was um, organized primarily by um, Veterans for Peace, Chapter 92, uh, Seattle Chapter 92, and uh, Mike, uh, Mike Dietrich is here. Um, who was instrumental in organizing uh, that first panel. Um, and uh, that was a panel that was focused uh, in large part on uh, veterans' uh, responses uh, to the, um, to the uh, documentary series. Um, we also, I want to also acknowledge Mike McCormick of uh, KEXP, who is um, videotaping uh, this uh, evening as uh, he did our October 7. Um, event. So I want to uh, introduce our panelists. Um, uh, I will um, be joining them eventually, but um, here are our ma main um, uh, presenters. Uh, and we go from uh, my immediate um, uh, right to uh, uh, further uh, away. Um, William uh, Turley. Uh, is a professor emeritus from the Department of Political Science of uh, Southern Illinois University. Um, he retired there in 2008 and has moved to Seattle. It's our luck that he is here. Uh, most of his writings examine the political institutions, processes, and policies of the Democratic Republic of Vietnam with a focus after 1990 on the politics of economic uh, reform and those who have been to Vietnam since then know that the uh, outcome is quite uh, spectacular. Um, Bill Turley is also um, uh, uh, the author of uh, the seminal work on the um, American War in Vietnam uh, with the title The Second Indochina War, A Concise Political and Military History. And then next to uh, Bill is uh, Judith Henshi, uh, the Southeast Asian Studies Curator at the UW Libraries. Uh, Judith has a PhD from the uh, uh, UW History Department with a focus on Vietnamese social and intellectual history in the 1920s and 30s in the late colonial er era. Um, before coming to UW, uh, she worked as an archivist at the University of Massachusetts, Boston, uh, with the uh, WGBH Vietnam, a television history media archive and other Vietnam-related collections. And the Ken Burns uh, Lenovic series that uh, just ran this September is ostensibly um, updating and um, updating that earlier uh, public uh, public broadcasting uh, a series on the Vietnam War from the early 1980s. Uh, next to uh, Judith is uh, Ling Thuy Nguyen. Um, uh, Ling is an assistant professor of American studies, ethnic st American ethnic studies at UW. Um, she has just arrived uh, at UW and we're uh, super happy that she is now joining us. Um, and she is working with an emphasis on 
Asian American Studies. Uh, Ling completed her PhD in Ethnic Studies at the University of California at San Diego, and her recent work has examined the intergenerational history and personal memory of the Vietnam War. Uh, research interests include critical immigration and refugee studies and race, war, and empire. And last but not least, um, on the uh, far right is uh, Xiu Hung Nguyen, um, who has recently completed her PhD in history at the University of Washington uh, with a specialization in the history of modern Vietnam. Uh, her work focuses on the social history um, of the Vietnam War, particularly in the city of uh, Hue in uh, central Vietnam. Uh, she's also interested in urban studies, war and diaspora studies, and storytelling. Uh, so this is our uh, panel. Uh, we're going to have the uh, five presentations. At first, we're going to have some um, uh, opportunity, perhaps, for um, intra-panel commentary and exchanges. And then we're going to uh, open it up to um, uh, question and answer. Um, uh, the Vietnam War uh, is a subject matter that um, elicits uh, strong emotions, oftentimes uh, strong opinions. Um, we would uh, like that. Uh, we would like you to engage, of course, in question and answer, um, but with um, all due respect and um, not with uh, too long and unfocused uh, statements. Uh, that uh, is a kind of a standard. Um, um, caveat that I would like to mention, like like with the uh, previous panel on October 7. So without further ado, uh, Bill Turley. Thank you, Christoph. Um, do I need this? Probably. My voice it doesn't carry quite like yours does. does. Uh, <clears throat> is it on? Is there a switch here? Is it on? Is it on? <laughs> it's on if I raise my voice a lot. Okay, I'll make myself heard one way or the other. Imagine I'm back in the classroom. I haven't taught in 10 years, so um, I forget how it's done. Uh, let me start with the true confession. Um, I did not see the series in the same time frame that most of you probably did because I was overseas when it was shown. So when I came back to the States, I had to stream it and, and, and watch a couple or three a day. And so I saw them all squished up in a bunch. But I also had the advantage, or maybe the disadvantage, of uh, reading quite a lot of reviews and commentaries that came out while the thing was being broadcast here. And so I suppose in some way I'm uh, reacting in a part to the reviews and the commentaries as well as to the, the series. So, so Bear in mind, I, I, I may not have quite the same take on things as my, my fellow panelists for that particular reason. Uh, that said, my broad conclusion is that the uh, documentary, which has met uh, a lot of criticism for, for, from, from academics, I think much of that criticism is unjustified in the following limited sense, that it lives up to its billing and its billing is very clear what it is, what it's about, what its aims are, and so forth on the PBS website. Ken Burns and Lynn Novick's 10-part, 18-hour documentary series, The Vietnam War, all caps, tells the epic story of one of the most consequential, divisive, and controversial events in American history, not Vietnamese, or anybody else's, American history, as it has never before been told on film. Yeah, well, uh, visceral and immersive, code words for affective, not analytical, not, not, uh, not explanatory, really, a uh, little bit manipulative, but yeah, there's the word, visceral and immersive. The series explores the human dimensions of the war, the human dimensions of the war, and indeed we do see a lot of people getting uh, 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 blown to bits or uh, 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 running out of burning villages and things of that sort through revelatory testimony some of it is in fact and I found it absolutely fascinating every once in a while there was a little bit of testimony that just sort of really set me back on my heels 
not as much as I'd like to see, of nearly 80 witnesses from all sides, Americans who fought in the war, others who opposed it, as well as combatants and, and uh, civilians from North and South Vietnam. So let's be clear, this is not a history. It is not a documentary history. It's the application of the Burns effect to historical facts. Uh, all of which, by the, virtually all of them, by the way, have long been familiar to academic historians of the war, but haven't achieved the degree of circulation throughout the general population, much less in the media, uh, that they deserve. So I think I'm, I'm ready to give Burns and Novick a certain amount of credit for, for getting some, some, some facts in their immersive and visceral, visceral way out in our faces and give us something to talk about. Uh, so, so I view it as a kind of as a springboard for the kind of conversation that we are about to have here. Now, in my own view of it, the thing that by about the second or third episode, I realized I was watching about a lot of battles and a lot of fighting and a lot of testimony from people who had been in battles and about the experience of combat and so forth. And that kind of surprised me. Um, and it, it, I realized as the reels went by that this heavy focus on the actual fighting and the veterans' experiences was leaving little space for much else. So some things are certainly squeezed in there. But it, it results in a number of distortions. One involving the actual fighting itself. Because the actual fighting that we are shown is pretty limited to the war of the big battalions. And this, or in other words, the conventional warfare side of, of the war. Uh, in spite of the fact that 60% uh, of Saigon forces who were killed uh, were South Vietnamese regional and popular forces, not the Arvin, not the main forces, 60% of them. The real war wasn't the war with the big battalions in casualty terms. It was a little war, dirty, nasty, la salle guerre, out of hidden the villages and so forth, fought by people who were part-times. Some of them you could call, call, call uh, 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 guerrillas, others were so-called regional forces who operated in their own locality out to a certain distance. They could be mobilized into main force battles from time to time, but their range of operation was relatively confined. Their weaponry was not particularly heavy, uh, and as those guys, other people, well, I'll, I'll expand on this scene a little later because it, you could see it sort of it got up my snout a little bit. But the war that they, that they show you, the images that they, that they present as this is the face of battle in Vietnam, is part of it, but it sure as heck is not all of it. Okay, that said is my introduction. I want to make some bullet points here, as quickly as I can, to leave as much time as possible. First, there's virtually nothing in the, 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 the uh, series about how the, the, the revolutionary side mobilized the forces to pretty much win the war by 1962 or three in the Mekong Delta, very close to Saigon, and by 1965 throughout the, the entire country, with relatively little help from up north. It was done by a, a, a very small organization. As of 1958, the, 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 the party membership in the South was somewhere south of 5,000. And it was from that nucleus that this machine was created and popular support was, was found. And these, these irregular forces were, were armed and trained and had the, the Saigon government forces on their heels by 1965 requiring a, a intervention. How the hell did they do that? Why isn't that a part of the story? Well, there's a marvelous little essay by Jeffrey Race that you all ought to look up. I forget where it's published, but the title of it is How They Won. I think it's in the Yale Review, back about 1970 or so. And it's a sort of a synoptic version of his book, War Comes to Long An. Long An being a very important, lush, rice-growing province just to the south of Saigon. In those days, you could actually cross some paddy fields to get to Long An. Now the southern uh, suburbs, the far ring of the suburbs of Saigon can all reach about that far. That was revolutionary territory. It was a no-go area, as we would say today, by about 63, uh, that close to Saigon itself, um, with no help from anybody outside the province to speak of. Very interesting. Second, 
There's very little in the documentary about the Allies, the so-called um, Free World Assistance Forces. Uh, up at total, I think, 26 different countries provided some kind of assistance, monetary, material, or so forth, at one time or the other, food, at one time or the other, to, to our war effort. But um, only, only four of them sent troops, and those were Australia, New Zealand, the Philippines, and South Korea, despite our pleading for other nations to join us in one great allied effort to fight communism. And of those four, <laughs> two of them had to be bribed. Now, you know, it's an important story. Uh, and it just isn't there. It, it, it says a whole lot about the degree to which we were prepared to go it alone, because essentially we did. Third, separate but linked wars and revolutions in Laos and Cambodia. There wasn't a Vietnam War. I, I resist calling it that. It was the Indochina War. That's the title of my book, the second Indochina, one of three in succession. Because Laos, Cambodia, Vietnam were of a piece when it came to, when it came to fighting this war. Certainly in the war plans uh, of, the, uh, 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 of the Lao Dung Party, the Communist Party in Hanoi. Certainly in the war plans of, of our, our, our military. From the beginning, it was assumed this war had to be fought right over to the Mekong and the boundary between Laos and Thailand. And all sides treated it that way. It was the hell with international law and whatever the, the Geneva Agreement said. That was all pushed aside uh, so that the war could be fought on a larger table. Um, fourth, uh, and I've already alluded to this, so I'll be very, very, very brief. The whole role uh, of irregular warfare on Saigon's side, people's war strategy on the, the revolutionary side. On Saigon's side, if you've never heard of Revdev or Rough Puffs, you don't know your Vietnam War history. It's very important. Uh, there was a constant effort by the revolutionary side and the Saigon government to develop what were simply mirror image armed forces and social structures at village level. And Saigon learned from the communists about how to do that with the assistance of defectors from the revolutionary side. And all of the Saigon government efforts to create a similar kind of political military structure at village level to build a kind of power with the peasants that the communists had succeeded so brilliant in doing came to naught. Why the hell could the communists do it, but our guys couldn't? There are answers to that question, but in the, the Burns documentary, it's a critically important question to understanding the war, the dynamic of it, why so many irregular bodies were killed, uh, and not only uh, main force, um, you can't tell the war story without telling that story. Um, and last, uh, there's a failure to, and I, I, I don't want to hold their feet to the fire on this because it's, it's, it really takes us into territory where historians don't like to go and maybe shouldn't. It's very controversial, but they give us no help as to how we might address the post-war controversies that are best understood as historical counterfactuals. But we're faced with the need to consider them because uh, they're very powerful forces, voices and forces have put them uh, forward. And one of these is the, the, the Nixon Kissinger thesis that the Vietnam War, uh, whether we won or lost it is really not so important, is that it held communism at bay so the non-communist countries of Southeast Asia could stabilize and develop and stand on their own feet. And they needed a, a couple decades to do that. So, you know, we got something good out of it. I think that's nonsense. Um, Another one is the, it's sort of a spin-off of the stab in the back thesis. Uh, Louis Sorley, who was quoted I think just once in the, towards the end of the, of, of the film is the primary proponent, but it's the notion that we had the war won sometime during 1972. It was, you know, the communists were, were on, the, on, the, on, on the wire basically, and uh, we just had to stick with it a little longer and, and Congress pulled the rug out from under the feet of our own armed forces and, and uh, the, the aid program to the Saigon government, and of course after that they couldn't withstand the onslaught from the north. Um, well, there are responses to these, and I didn't see any material 
in, I don't expect them to answer those or even deal with them, but I didn't see anything in what they presented to help me think about it. And uh, I'm sorry, those are the controversies that have the most political punch in our national conversation today. Period. I have more to say, but I better stop there. Thank you. <coughs> Did I go over my 10 minutes? I don't think so. Okay. Okay, so we have ten. Oh, okay, so I'm going to use this one since I think we know it works, although I have to re-angle it to my diminutive stature here. Um, well, it's hard to follow uh, the real experts, and I have to say I feel a little bit of a, f of, um, of a fraud here since, uh, as Christoph pointed out, um, I'm actually a colonial era historian. Um, my claim to knowing anything very much about the, this particular war period is that um, I was living in the US. Well, in fact, I was living in Britain, of course, during a time when Britain was too engaged in not, not so much overtly, but I have you know, met, met actually American veterans who said that they were flying with um, unmarked US Air Force bombers um, during the war. Um, but anyway, um, so my, my interest here is having kind of lived through the aftermath of, aftermath of the war in the U.S., but also um, having worked with Vietnam War collections and being a kind of, uh, um, you know, a scholar of, the, of Vietnam, albeit in another period. So um, I'm interested in, I mean, this would be a long-term project, but it would be very interesting to actually compare these two um, PBS series, of course, they weren't actually made by PBS, but the WGBH series, of uh, Vietnam, a, a television history that was aired in 1983, and like the Burns Novick series, was a long time in the making, and uh, meticulously prepared with what they called Vietnam University. They brought in all the then experts about Vietnam in order to uh, train the directors or the producers and um, what they uh, should be looking at. So that, too, was a very hyped um, series. Um, and I'm interested in that because I think, sort of like, like Bill, I'm, I'm interested in how, um, how these series are kind of reflections of public opinion of the time and how public opinion, in fact, correlates to the kind of evidence that we have before us and how we deal with that, deal with that evidence. Um, so, of course, you know, the evidence that we have before us is very different um, now than it was in, in 1983. So it seems to me that the Vietnam War was not just the television war, as it was often uh, proclaimed. Um, its public image was both made through its exposure, that is to say, through its um, production every night as a television event, but also through its secrecy and its lies. So um, we begin to see revelations um, as early as the 70s, obviously, with the publishing of the, um, the Pentagon Papers in 71. And I think there's this interesting tension between these, these kinds of the revelations, a series of revelations, and, and, uh, and the kind of the lies and the secrecy. So we have the revelations, of course, about the unauthorized bombing of Cambodia, the revelations about My Lai and other um, atrocities. So, in the face of this, it seems to me that um, in 83, the objectives of the Vietnam television history was one of kind of truth-seeking, um, with a focus on understanding through a sequence of critical decisions that led to the U.S. involvement. And, you know, they did this through this kind of meticulous research and through interviewing um, almost all of the high-profile people that they could find at the time, and that was pretty much anybody who had anything to say or do with the war. Um, and I have a list of the people that they interviewed, actually, so it's interesting to look at that. And, of course, many of those people are now dead, so people like Archimedes Paddy. Um, it's uh, fascinating. And I should just say, um, they also have put all those materials online. So WGBH has the, used the uh, open, open vault to, um, to put all of that interview material online. So that is just fabulous. Um, so in a, as opposed to this kind of truth seeking, which I think Vietnam television history was all about, um, I think that um, the Burns uh, publicity, as Bill has pointed out, you know, it did make some claims to finding new truths, but it also adhered, I think, very much to this motto that there is no single truth in war. I mean, that was the thing that you saw repeatedly in the trailers. 
Um, but um, certainly they were looking, they were searching for some kind of understanding. So here I think you call this the Burns effect. Um, I, th I, yeah, I see this as a, as a kind of attempt to create some kind of aesthetic interpretation of the war that is, is creating an enduring narrative, and that is what this Burns effect is really all about. Um, so, um, you know, who better? So, yeah, as this search for a kind of aestheticized interpretation that can fix the Vietnam War in national memory, and who better to do this than Ken Burns as, you know, this, this kind of the icon of national history making, or even myth making, perhaps. I mean, I think this is where, you know, some of us can get into some interesting dis discussions on the actual um, content of what's going on here. But I think that there is this sort of searching for a common humanity, um, something that's going to make people come out of this um, feeling better about themselves. Um, and I have to agree with Bill. I think it does this magnificently, um, that, you know, it, it, it chooses people who are endearing, um, their narratives are, um, you know, heroic, and we go through this kind of tragedy, uh, heroic responses, and then families are united, and we can, you know, feel good about it in some way. Um, so, oh, I, I should say one of the first things that struck me about the series in this regard is the, um, the very beginning where, of course, the, the film is run in reverse, which I have to say I found very annoying. And it, it seems to me that this is almost um, saying that, and this too is a sort of reflection of our technological society, that we now can control these events in some kind of technological way, so we can kind of run these things backwards to a point of erasure in some sense. So I, I just found that extremely annoying, another kind of, you know, gimmick of the, of the modern age. So this, it's, you know, I see it as this uh, attempt to create this sort of national narrative, and I don't know, maybe Ling can speak to this, but it seems that it doesn't, really address the, the narrative of, of who America is now, because of course it doesn't address, you know, the 1.3 million Vietnamese Americans who um, are in fact part of the Vietnamese, uh, part of the American story now. So um, to turn to my other point here, it, which is to look at this from the point of documentation, um, as we probably are, are aware, you know, 30 years is the kind of mandatory release period for US agency documents. So most of the Vietnam War material was released by 2005, unless, of course, it was, you know, secret, uh, CIA, etc. So as Bill pointed out, you know, we do know a lot more now than we did in 1983. And many of the, the kind of attitudes that were considered to be, you know, just fringe notions that were <laughs> adhered to by some kind of conspiratorial left have now, in fact, been proved, they're, they're out there. And I think that the Burns documentary does that, that it kind of makes these mainstream, these things that only, you know, some of us have kind of understood for a long time. Um, so these things are now kind of proven to be true, you know. We know, now know about the Gulf of Tonkin incident with the release of the, you know, the logs from the Maddox and the Turner Joy. Um, the, the kind of reversals in the autobiographies of, of people like McNamara. We know now understand the early, the, the skepticism, how, just how early this skepticism that this war could ever be, be won or be successful. And those, those views are now kind of widely held. Um, so, do I have about another, am I running out of time? Okay. Um, Okay, so the other thing I wanted to talk about is this idea of the making of the South. And I think other people have commented on this. To me, um, the failure of the series to really get to the heart of the divisions that are at the basis of, of the war itself. And um, I was very disappointed watching this series because I think, as, as other people have noted, the first one is probably the weakest which claims to deal with the colonial period, and which of course is, is my <laughs> particular <laughs> love. And to deal with, you know, the, the, this hundred years of history in an hour seems uh, a little absurd. But not only that, but that hour, in fact, is, is repeatedly interrupted 
by this kind of return to the present, as if, you know, the viewers can't possibly have to deal with this ugly history stuff. Let's give them, you know, this kind of, this ongoing narrative of, of the 1960s and the narratives from the, from the vets, endearing as they are. You know, I would have liked to see much more of that, that real history. So I think what is lost there is really an understanding of this genesis of the South as a kind of separate, uh, either as a real separate entity or as an imagined separate entity. And, um, you know, I, I see this in part in the 1930s, that's my period, you know, the South has a very different history. I mean, I think they do, they do mention the divisions of Indochina and mm -hmm. they don't at all. Um, yeah, I mean, it is crucially important that, you know, Cochin China, Tonkin and Annam were separate entities, that Cochin China is the only colony. As a result of that, it has very different laws and it enjoys certain freedoms that, because it's a colony. It enjoys certain freedoms that come as a result of being under French law. So, you know, the newspapers are freer in the South and in many ways there's a more vibrant kind of press activity that goes on in the South. And as a result of that, I think, you know, there are certain, um, there's more vibrant exchange there, um, not only amongst the communists, but the non-communist elements too, and those are not looked into um, at all. Um, the beginnings of these um, non-communist non nationalists, the non-Stalinist Marxist nationalists, um, there's a whole variety, a whole array of of intellectual themes that are, or intellectual influences that are percolating through well, the whole country, of course, in the 30s, but I think particularly in, in the South. So, um, now after, 19, after 1945 and the, um, the defeat of the Japanese, there's this moment where the French, you know, they know that Ho Chi Minh is consolidating his power, the Viet Minh is consolidating their power, and I think they see this opportunity to try and consolidate power in the South. And in fact, you know, there's an attempt in 46 at the Dalat Conference to um, create a separate Cochin China, a kind of state within Cochin China that would be a bulwark against the sort of the communist North. So I think all of that is kind of lost and it seems to me that it's critically important in understanding how this, um, how this kind of notion of the South comes into being and um, and then again in the period 1953-54 when this character Ed Lansdale <laughs> first goes to Vietnam. And Ed Lansdale I believe is mentioned once in the series without any introduction. And of course he was absolutely critical in forging this kind of symbolic notion of the South and um, building up uh, noting Zeeum's regime and creating this kind of, um, you know, through you know, psychological operations, which of course he'd been involved in in the Philippines too, and against the Huck Rebellion. So he comes back and he's sort of part of this effort to, um, to build up this notion of, of a South and putting, cobbling together this kind of old coalition in Cochin China of the, the Francophone, Catholic, and anti Stalinist Marxist elites. Um, and um, I think that's very important. And I, I just want to sort of lastly say how I think this, this fits into um, our categorization of the war. Um, this series, I think, rather casually describes it as a civil war. And I think that's something that we need to debate because, you know, in one sense, in my mind, it is a civil war in the sense that here's two parts of the country that come under differing influences, foreign influences um, under colonialism and have very different visions of um, how their emancipation from the French is going to play out. So even if you accept that both the Democratic Republic and the Republic, the states themselves both are claiming kind of ter um, territorial sovereignty over, the, over this one um, area of Vietnam, I think the mindsets of those different people, of the, the mindsets in those areas are, are somewhat different and their, their approaches are different. So is that a civil war, even though it's also a proxy war? I mean, I think that that's, uh, in my mind, one of the questions that is not, it's just not really investigated. And that's in part because there isn't this kind of cold hit, holistic history of the South. Thank you. Okay. Hi, I'm so nervous to be on this panel because I'm not a historian, so I have no... Uh, Neither am I, by the way. 
no corrections <laughs> <laughs> to uh, you know any any of the political theories about the war, or any of the history of the war. Obviously, was not alive during the war. Um, but some of my comments. So I do research on basically the aftermath of the war. You know, how does the war live on? How uh, does that that moment continue and, and what happens with the trauma, right? So just to build a little bit off of what Judy was saying, I think that there are ways that, um, I'm really interested in the reception of the film, right? The circulation, the reception, so I'm gonna be really interested to hear from the audience, why are you here on a Tuesday evening? It's very windy outside. What do you hope to get from this, right? Um, so why are you here? But so um, I think that the documentary series um, as something that's on public television with a uh, viewership of close to 40 million viewers when it was actually happening um, in this era of tweets. Uh, you, if you can sit for an hour and 30 minutes and do it for 18 hours, then I applaud you, right? Because when it came out, I was like, oh, here's a, here's a thing I have to do, it's so long. <laughs> I think that it does work of orienting people towards something, right? So they're trying to orient the American public towards a certain kind of narrative about the war where they disavow any sort of responsibility. They say, we're not trying to tell you what to think or feel, uh, but the end, in the end, it, they're always trying to tell you what to think or what to feel, right? So they're trying to create a, a universalized, a cohesive narrative about the war, uh, and they say that they do so in this nonpartisan way by interviewing Vietnamese people as well as American veterans, right? Well, it is very much a war history, right? All of the events are centered around military operations. The, interview, uh, the interviewees are primarily veterans, right? And so how does that really frame, in a limited way, our understanding of war? Does war not permeate civilian life, right? So, I mean, you have the Gold Star Mother being interviewed, you have some other folks, but I think it does a disservice to the, the significance of international warfare to only talk about um, war as something that happens in the battlefield in certain kinds of operations, right? They talk a little bit about PTSD and how people bring that home, but there's more than that. There's much more than that. So um, I found uh, particularly problematic uh, an interview that um, Burns and Novick did on Fresh Air, where I think it was Novick saying, you know, related to this, uh, this question of whether or not it's a civil war, uh, she said something about, uh, you know, the Vietnamese were exceptional too. They had kind of their own manifest destiny, which is a misappropriation and misunderstanding that manifest destiny was, is, is driven by white supremacy. And white supremacy really drove the United States to enter into this war. The, the fact of un being unwilling to acknowledge that a third world country of brown people wants independence from the French, right? So I think this question of whether or not it's a civil war requires us to decontextualize that anti-colonial sentiment, right? So um, it, it cannot be their own manifest destiny if they're fighting their own battle for liberation in their own lands, right? Um, and then related to that, um, the ways that it is really just limited to Vietnam, right? So what would happen if uh, Hmong soldiers were speaking, right? So Hmong soldiers, Hmong veterans, the most invisible Vietnam War veterans, Right, how would that change the narrative of, of the Vietnam War? Right? Um, how would it challenge people's understanding of where that war was located? Who are the Hmong people? Why were they there? Why were they involved in this war? Right? It opens up different kinds of questions. So for me, it was about, um, they keep talking about reconciliation. They keep framing it in terms of healing. And Burns himself never says that um, he's trying to heal from the war. It's um, uh, that the one veteran who's, who uh, they feature a lot in the film is talking about how it's about healing and reconciliation. And then my question is for whom, right? And I think that uh, it's very much, uh, it's, it's obviously a beautiful film. It's, it's um, anything that you can uh, get millions of dollars to do. You can hire professionals to do very well, right? It's beautiful. Um, but uh, I think that it's an attempt to reconcile with American veterans and whether or not the veterans here agree with that, that was what it seemed like. So I'd be, I'd be interested to hear um, your response to whether or not you feel that way. Um, but I think that, um, you know, so to also speak to what Judy said, it really doesn't imagine the United States to exist the way that it does, right? So um, if 1.3 million refugees uh, came afterwards, and we're multiple genera generations away from that now, you know, who is watching this documentary series and what are they hoping to get out of it? 
I imagine that the intentions are very diverse, right? So, um, for example, I've taken a Vietnamese language class, and uh, for me, there's uh, wanting to get in touch with, with my cultural heritage, wanting to um, do research, um, and then there was a, a military historian who wanted to learn Vietnamese so he could figure out what the U.S. had done wrong so that he, because they could have won that war, right? So for him, it was about how to fight that war again for the future. Right, and so we have different intentions coming into watching the documentary series and different things that we're hoping to get out of it. And I think it's a, a little bit, um, you know, there's, there's a lot of oversight in not thinking about the large refugee community that, that are American citizens and that exist in the United States. And does watching the series um, tell the second generation anything about why their parents don't want to talk about that? I think it does a little bit. Right? There's a little bit of kind of um, violence, war pornography in it, right? So these excruciating to watch scenes where uh, people who look like my grandmother, you know, are being tortured and killed, um, and the fact that they um, went out and got AK-47s and shot at pumpkins so they could lay the soundtrack over these images, right? So thinking about the fabrication of, of this affect that Bill's talking about that they're trying to generate, right? Um, there's that part of it, but the other large part of the story, and this takes us back to the anti-colonial movement, is the experience of racism. Why the United States was involved abroad had to do with white supremacy and racism. Why refugees were treated the way they were treated when they came back. Um, why people, why the first generation didn't want to talk about it and then had to come to the United States and be visible reminders of the U.S. defeat. Um, and they, they struggled with what word to use, right? The U.S. failure. And I would say it was the U.S.'s failure to, to maintain its empire, right? Which is not a conversation that is really brought up in the film at all. Um, but this, uh, this conversation of, you know, how, how to deal with the aftermath of the war in terms of the trauma of, of physical violence, of emotional and psychological violence, and then to have to live um, in the United States post-civil rights um, in a, this very conservative environment and have to deal with the day-to-day -day racism of trying to live in the United States um, as refugees of war dealing with racism on a day-to-day -day basis, I think is a huge un underlying current of all of it that is not discussed at all. And so I'm not trying to... Um, argue that they should have included all of these things, right? It's, as a director or producer, you make decisions about the story that you're going to tell. Everything else gets cut because it doesn't make sense because you have to make time. But um, it just left me with this question of what kinds of feelings, how are they trying to orient us towards this history? And with whom were the filmmakers trying to reconcile? I feel like after you know all of these people, after listening to um, all of the uh, comments, um, I feel like yeah, there's a lot, there's a lot more to do. Um, and um, I just have a few comments on the film itself and uh, also the, uh, the uh, impacts of the film um, to our scholarship. Um, so uh, you know, to um, our um, uh, in our cur current uh, scholarship, uh, we have to um, we we can tell that there's a lot of um, insights into the diversity of views and experiences that the film provide, and and especially um, you know to um, from the American side, but also it's um, uh, from the Vietnamese side uh, to a lot of uh, American um, audience, the target audience of the film. Uh, we still um, a lot of us uh, don't know much about like what really the Vietnamese uh, uh, people in Vietnam. Uh, you know, a lot of them, as you can tell from the film, um, a lot of their thoughts are framed in um, in the official official state of you know the uh, narrative of liberation. You know, against invasion and uh, foreign aggression. Um, so we through the film we we really see the the uh, connection and also the counterpoints, the diversity of the, the perspectives of the um, history. Uh, but ultimately, this film, is, uh, this series is about um, 
U.S. history, and uh, it's for American audience. It's for it's part of the American experience. Um, so, um, and to me, it's still a lot about the military history um, of the historical period. Uh, we don't really uh, hear, we don't see much about the um, the other side, uh, or I mean the. Um, like there's much more uh, happening in Vietnam on the ground uh, that we didn't really see in the war, uh, in the film. Um, so for example, as uh, uh, my research on social history of the, uh, of the war, uh, there's still a lot more about the social life and cultural life in um, uh, the wartime that we, in wartime that we didn't really see in the film. Um, the impacts of the war on economy and on um, you know security, for example, it's very obvious in in Vietnam, in the, especially in the southern part of Vietnam back then. Um, also, we don't really know much about the views and the thoughts of the people on uh, various uh, sides or you know uh, groups, social groups um, in uh, wartime. Uh, you know the so-called uh, VC or the Northerners and the Southerners. Also about the American who um, went to Vietnam and stay in Vietnam for you know shorter or longer time. Um, also the views of um, uh, the, the views of the people on really communism, because we all know that the war is basically uh, it's such a, a big theme, but uh, as you know, some, we, we talk about civil war and, and all that, uh, we don't really, through the film, I mean, it's, I mean, it would, it would be nice to frame it so that people can um, um, encourage people to think about you know such big theme of communism or war or uh, you know put it in the Cold War context um, also um, the film in the series um, I guess it didn't really did a good job on um, interpreting diff in uh, different stories in different locations in Vietnam uh, in the, you know, we talk about Vietnam War, and as um, Bion, uh mentioned earlier, uh, you know, there's no uh, appearance of Laos and Cambodia, but also different locations in Vietnam, urban area, rural area, the mountainous area, uh, the non-King people, uh, the non-Viet people, you know, in Vietnam we often say that we have 54 minority groups, uh, we don't see any of them. Um, the central region in Vietnam, and uh, basically these uh, locations appear only when uh, we talk about the battlefields happening there. Um, other than that, we don't really know uh, anything about different uh, location and, and what's really going on in different uh, geographical areas in Vietnam. Um, yeah, similarly, uh, different peoples, different groups of people, uh, you know, the, the effects of the, of the war on lives and, you know, family, the family, a lot of family was split uh, during, um, because of the war and during wartime. Um, also, um, people from different backgrounds, educational backgrounds and re religious background. Um, people with different um, political views and all that. So we, um, you know, I just want to mention like that's that's a lot, a lot more about uh, the uh, this complex, very complex um, and uh, historical period that we um, didn't really. Well, the the filmmakers they did a good job, but not all of them. Um, the second thing I, I want to say um, about this series is. I have to, um, I mean, I really admire the effort that the filmmaker made to um, conduct so many interviews uh, because we have to really see that the, the, the interviews are very central from the beginning, uh, from the beginning of the, the series. And it's actually the greatest strength of this documentary in my, in my, um, in my opinion. It's actually um, because you know because of the disappearing generation uh, of the people who leave through that war period. Uh, war period. Um, we we you know like that's a television history um, um, with a lot of uh, 
interviews that conducted in the, in the early 1980s. And 20 years later, um, a lot of people already died. And now, again, we have another group of filmmakers going to Vietnam, or I mean, going to a lot of places, not only Vietnam, I mean, in the US and Vietnam, to interview those really history makers um, that um, witnessed, that participated in uh, the war. Uh, I read a, an, uh, an article that uh, Lee Nordwick um, answered the, some questions about the, the, the interviewing process, and they said that they, um, they spent, for each interviewee, they spent five to six hours you know, to get to know them and to really to ask all the questions before they get to the point that they, 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 film, they film the whole thing. But like, really to get to the, the moment when they can quote that and cut them into the, to, to put into the film. And I mean, as someone who did lots of interviews uh, with the war generation as well, I have to say that this really, um, it's really impressive. Because you, you, you know, watching the film, you remember there's a lot of um, really emotional moments um, that, for example, the, um, the Berlin uh, John Musgrave with a sharp spoken guy, you know, like really the, we can feel like that emotion is still on the surface, that, that really the war is still going on to a lot of people. Um, it still exists. Uh, until now, and uh, when I talk to a lot of um, um, people, um, the war generation of the war generation, um, yes, the 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 emotion, the memory, the story, um, they are still there. Um, and I have to say that when the interview, when the the interviewees, um, after five or six moment, uh, six hours, they get into that process. It's really that they have to leave that moment again. I mean, imagining that all of these soldiers, you know, they, they really experience the trauma or experience the the feeling, the emotion, or all of the the head or the, the, the fear and all that, you know, that they experienced during wartime 40 years, 50 years ago. So that was really, I, I mean, to me, it's really um, the the, the strength that uh, of the documentaries that the filmmakers were able to to use these interviews, you know, to enable the the viewers like us to access different perspectives of the historical period. Um, and one one more note on that is actually that we we see no historians or experts uh, in the in the film. So it's just the only the participants and only the. The, the soldiers, the veterans, um, or the civilians um, of that time. Um, and one minor thing uh, that actually I have to say uh, that the film, uh, as um, the, uh, the other panelists here mentioned, um, it has a great impact on um, viewers uh, at this moment when a lot of people now again talking about the war. Um, I want to um, draw your attention on uh, one thing that, of course, we are here in America, and uh, we all know about like how the war affected uh, affected uh, the U.S. and uh, you know all of that. Um, but to the Vietnamese viewers in Vietnam, um, they didn't really know um, how America would interpret the war, how the, the war shaped America since then. And um, the compared to the uh, television war in the early 1980s, uh, still very like limited number of Vietnamese people had a chance to see that documentary. But with this Vietnam War uh, series, a lot of people in Vietnam now are also are talking about the war again. And especially with the new perspectives and the new views that they learn from the series. Um, but of course, a lot of people, uh, I mean, not only Vietnamese in Vietnam, also Vietnamese in the US, uh, the Vietnamese Americans in the US are now uh, arguing with each other on uh, various issues uh, in the film that, um, you know, the perspectives on the, RV, uh, on the Republic of Vietnam in the South and the American views. Um, 
but really the film um, to some extent it 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 was an open eye to a lot of people um, on the war itself and also like the the legacy of the war um, people I would say a lot of people welcome and really broaden and and deepen their knowledge on the on the war and you know two Vietnamese people who were directly affected by um, the war um, this is something really um, important um, and uh, maybe open up a lot of discussions among Vietnamese uh, the first generation and the second generation um, both you know in the US and in Vietnam thanks Myself have had a, a chance to um, comment on the series already on October 7 on the um, uh, Veterans for Peace panel. So I just want to uh, briefly summarize uh, some of my points, and um, in particular because I have already mentioned some of, my, uh, of the points that I uh, made as well. Uh, so um, uh, I agree with Bill that. Uh, in many ways, the Burns Novik series is a windfall for our profession, for those of us who are uh, engaged in teaching and researching about uh, the Vietnam War. It has uh, come back, so to say, on the agenda. And uh, for that, we, we should certainly be, uh, be grateful. Uh, I also agree that uh, Burns and Novik make it pretty clear that their focus is much more on the kind of effects of the war on American society, on American culture and politics and they are staying true to that. But um, my, own point, my own points are uh, going off of the claims that this series is now presenting a kind of a new take, quote unquote, a new take on the Vietnam War, and also the kind of self-congratulatory claim that it is standing apart from anything that came before because of its so-called inclusion of uh, Vietnamese voices. Um, as somebody who's interested in rhetorical framing and spatial representations of the war, um, I wanted to echo some of the points that uh, my co-panelists have made already and then uh, quickly move on to uh, the question of terminology and inclusion. But also I agree that the, um, uh, the 75 minute focus on uh, 101 years uh, from the uh, late 1850s to 1961 is uh, criminally short. And uh, this is, of course, where uh, historians put a lot of emphasis. Um, if you don't get your foundational history right, it will cascade uh, throughout the entire narrative. And I think this is uh, uh, one of my main criticisms of that series that Ken Burns and, and Linovic don't seem to have much interest in actually uh, trying to lay that foundation for what is to come uh, later on. So um, if you want to uh, claim that you are uh, uh, creating a new take, a new perspective, uh, then I would expect documentarians to try to make visible um, what is usually not visible to us because we assume it is so natural. It's such a given and uh, making Things that seem natural to us, unnatural, to decenter them, that would be a new take. But instead, we see a kind of rushing through the colonial period, and here especially, uh, what, is, what is that colonial uh, system? Um, we in the West seem to be very comfortable with just uh, eliding um, the uh, details of that system, and particularly that it was a capitalist and white supremacist system that, uh, that created racial and economic hierarchies throughout the world uh, as one of the foundational ways in which our world still works today. Um, white supremacy never appears in this uh, series, even though it played a foundational role in understanding what motivated Americans, what motivated French, but also what, what uh, motivated the uh, many Vietnamese that were um, becoming uh, involved in the war uh, later on. The United States itself emerges as kind of an ahistorical, neutral, uh, well-meaning, kind of uh, bumbling um, and innocent 
a player when, in fact, the United States, of course, was intimately involved in that global system of uh, racial and uh, economic uh, supremacy. And uh, cascading from that, of course, is then what uh, Bloom already mentioned as well, is that the, um, the emphasis on a kind of blanket uh, uh, terminology of the other side as communist, uh, again, I think, um, is undercutting the great uh, diversity of uh, voices and visions for the nation that emerged in the late colonial period and then in the um, 1940s and not 1950s. Um, terminology matters. And uh, here, I think, um, again, in that first uh, installment of the series, uh, Ken Burns and Ingo Rick fall short because uh, they could have really tried to give us a different narrative that breaks through the old style uh, Cold War and Western assumptions about how the wor world functions and how history evolved, in particular in, in Vietnam. Um, the series is uh, talking endlessly about North Vietnamese and South Vietnamese. It posits that at Geneva, the country of Vietnam was divided into two countries, which is counterfactual, it's not the case. Uh, the Geneva Accords, in fact, uh, asserted the indivisibility of one Vietnam. Uh, the contending states were not claiming to be separate countries. They were contending states that did not acknowledge the legitimate legitimacy of the other. But when we use terminology like South Vietnam or South Vietnamese and North Vietnam and North Vietnamese, then we are falling back into an uncritical American narrative that was uh, very willfully constructed in the Cold War to legitimize American war goals. So this is uh, what I want to say about the claim that this was a new take. Um, I don't think it is because a new take would, for example, try to transcend um, terminology like the North Vietnamese or the North Vietnamese Army, when in fact it was the People's Army of Vietnam. North Vietnamese army would make people who fought in their own country in their own understanding foreigners in their own country. Um, uh, when we call the NLF the Viet Cong, uh, Burns and Novik acknowledged that this was a derogatory term uh, that smeared uh, Southern revolutionaries, and yet they persist in using the term. So a new take for me would mean to have the courage to really uh, 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 step into new territory and make your viewers see something that seems to be uh, uh, well known in a wholly uh, new light. Finally, the claim of inclusion. And uh, here, I think um, uh, this year is, is painfully self congratulatory. Um, but um, as I said before in my ruminations about uh, terminology, um, if you want to include others in a narrative, you also have to make <clears throat> that space for them, for their narratives and for their takes. And uh, what ultimately happens here is a conglomeration of American faces and Vietnamese faces and Vietnamese of several um, ideological stripes and uh, uh, backgrounds and experiences. But there is no real space in that series to really hear uh, Vietnamese uh, takes on their experiences. Uh, they are integrated into a more or less unchanged American narrative, and that makes inclusion really simply adornment, um, but not really a respectful inclusion that would um, open up uh, new avenues of understanding. If I also may, um, I would like, because uh, I think uh, Lynn brought it up, uh, to uh, give you three bullet points that I took away from our panel with uh, Vietnam War veterans, from uh, Veterans for Peace. Um, uh, clearly, the series is interested in kind of finding some kind of a reconciliation uh, uh, among uh, deeply divided Americans, uh, kind of a, uh, seeking a healing. And bullet point number one that I took away from the uh, veterans panel was that um, uh, many veterans are not interested necessarily in healing 
as a kind of blanket narrative that makes us all feel uh, good about ourselves in the end. Um, one uh, criticism of the series was that, in fact, the series shied away from accountability. Um, veterans, um, if I uh, understood that first bullet point from them, felt that they were lied to, uh, that their, their were sacrifices were um, uh, made under a kind of false assumptions. And uh, what they are really interested in is not necessarily healing, but accountability and um, truth telling. Uh, the second bullet point I took away from the veterans discussion on October 7 was that um, the, uh, uh, the VMW, the <clears throat> Vietnam Veterans Against the War, that are very prominently featured in the later uh, parts of the series, were not just anti-war kind of rebel rousers, but uh, what the series uh, fails to acknowledge is that uh, Vietnam Veterans Against the War were um, uh, some of the very, very first that advocated uh, for the interests of returning veterans. Uh, so their, their goals were much greater than simply to stop the war, but to really advocate for the interests, uh, the uh, psychological, psychiatric, the health interests, the social services interests of returning um, uh, veterans. And the third bullet point I took away from that veterans discussion was that um, the series fell into a kind of a trap of the uh, a tired trope of uh, Vietnam veterans being abused only by the uh, kind of uh, hippie um, stereotyped uh, anti-war uh, left in the United States. And what was really not uh, shown in the series was that if abuse happened, that for many returning Vietnam veterans, the abuse in fact came from quite the other side, from the kind of American Legion uh, Legion, uh, World War II generation types that berated them for um, defeat and uh, and so on. So these are the three bullet points I took away from that uh, discussion, just to bring this in as well uh, in response to what Nick said. Good. So these are our presentations, and I want to invite the panelists first to, um, if there are comments or responses to you know, each other. The microphone. Um, there's some themes circulating through here, and I'm, I'm not sure I can tie them together, but a couple are sort of working in the back of my mind, and I think it's kind of interesting to moment. And one has to do, I think Judith sort of first was put it on the table, uh, had to do with the the the, um, the to what degree there was a a national consciousness particular to the South. Mm -hmm. And you know, near the very end of the series, I think it's the narrator says, quote, yeah, it was the narrator, there had never been a South Vietnamese nation. And by any strict definition, I think that's true, we would agree. But I remember the last time I was there before the war ended, that was, that was in uh, mid-1973, fall of 73. Um, during that year, I was beginning to hear educated Saigonese uh, refer to South Vietnamese nationalism, mm -hmm. speaking English. Mm -hmm. And I, at the time, I thought, well, that's kind of peculiar, mm -hmm. but it's interesting. But you have mm -hmm. to uh, consider the source. But I just mm -hmm. lay that out. I don't know what to make of it to this day. If anybody mm -hmm. has a comment on that, fine. But then thinking further, and then here, here goes to some of the other comments, uh, what makes the South special in a way it is a pluralism in its history and that was partly thanks to the French on the political side because it tolerated a certain amount of party organization mm -hmm. so there was a, 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 a somewhat maybe a thin stratum of familiarity with political pluralism that didn't exist ever in the North mm -hmm. and in addition the ethnic setting is quite plural the religious setting is quite plural so the, the notion of pluralism in society and as a political objective fact that must be dealt with, um, I'm asking myself, hmm, I wonder if my mm -hmm. friends in Saigon in 1973 were, were musing to themselves in their, in their dreams or something about how to reconcile 
the fact of pluralism in their society with the 4,000 years of, uh, or, of a more organic concept of the state and nation. Uh, and I don't, anyway, just uh, I thought of, Jerry Hickey, by the way, is a name to throw in here because of his, his relationship to, to the, the mountain, the, excuse my, I'm so old, the Montagnard, the, the, um, the ethnic minorities in, in the Highlands. And um, again, it's the name that if you're not familiar with and are interested in, 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 in it, his personal history as an advocate for the minorities in the context of the war, as well as who the minorities were and what role they played in the war, uh, is, 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 is an 18 part series in itself and uh, 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 really extraordinary. Um, and then this, I found myself too at the end of it saying, you know, what are they drive, what are they pushing towards? I, I get this constant feeling of being nudged from behind to think and feel a certain way. And they're never explicit about it, but my conclusion was indeed, it's sort of pushing it towards a very orthodox narrative. I'm using orthodox in the tense, in the sense the term came up among historians about a decade or two ago. They had the, the, the orthodox narrative and the um, revisionist narrative, and these were supposedly contending forces in his, his historical studies. And uh, uh, the orthodox was, it, it's, it's, um, um, it's, I think it's the one that the most, uh, uh, most Americans buy into now without knowing it. If a Gallup poll going back uh, quite a ways, it, it still holds. 70% of Americans, and I forget the exact date, it's here, uh, maybe the, the poll in 2000, um, answered yes, the war was a mistake. And the, the same number, or very close to it, 68 I think, said, and we lost it. Uh, and that was what the historians, the academic historians' orthodox narrative was trying to nudge the nation towards believing. I don't think that we had a, anything to do with it whatsoever. It was just the, 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 the dreadful duration and pain of the war that pushed a lot of Americans toward that feeling. But that is consonant with the orthodox narrative that I think Burns and Novick are selling and maybe they themselves are not aware of it. I don't know. So I think part and parcel of that, what is claimed to be the orthodox narrative is that um, historians claims that the war was unwinnable mm -hmm. and that a, the Republic of Vietnam, AKA South Vietnam, was not a um, entity that could have survived on its own. I think Essentially. These, the, these, are, yeah. these are core claims yeah. of, of what is, what is portrayed as the orthodox war. Yeah. I myself, I'm not convinced that there is actually such a split between orthodoxy and I revisionism. Yeah. I think that's a kind of, a, uh, in fact, an American academic yeah. argument. I think when you, when you look at the more global... Well, um, nobody uses the terms anymore. Right? Yes, the global scholarship, I think we're, we're far, far beyond that now. Um, but that's yes, but, I, but, but I, it, 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 it dates them. That's what I'm. Yes. That's why I mention it. Yes. Well, I, and I, it, it's not a new take. I'm, 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 I'm riffing off your remark. It's the opposite. It's right. an old take. Right. It's a it's a rather um, standard narrative and American narrative yeah. of the war yeah. that is reaffirmed. Yeah, I agree. I don't know that you can say that revisionism is off the table when the official reevaluation of the war that took place. Was it two years ago with that, um, the Pentagon. official Pent Pentagon um, kind of commemoration of the war? Mm, I mean, that is, yes, I believe it is still going on. Yeah. Um, was, um, so I, I mean, I think you could call it revisionist, hmm. that there was little acceptance of some of these um, notions of the unwinnability of, of the war. I think you're all getting tired and you're speaking lower and lower. Oh, sorry, sorry. 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 Oh, we're speaking to ourselves now, and that's well, a yes, big yes, mistake. Yes. Okay, you're right. Yes. Yeah. Yes, I, I, I just wanted to say also I'm glad that Ling and, of course, Christoph brought up the ra racist dimension because I was, I was, you know, all, I think other people have also been struck by this, um, the war having been um, engaged in by well-meaning, I think the phrase is, you know, well-meaning men um, and it, good good in, with good mm -hmm. intentions. And, you know, I think that the recent scholarship just um, 
completely disavows that, and that you know the, that the U.S. was exactly um, following the French arrogance in assuming you know racial superiority when they when they took over the the, you know, the both the um, was funding the war, but also creating this kind of new symbolism for the cr creation of the South. It was a it was based on a kind of racist assumption that the Vietnamese were not going to be able to, you know, govern themselves just as the French. Yes, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm trailing you. Oh well, I'm I'm just want to make a, 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 a small comment on the orthodox and 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 revisionist. Um, well, we didn't really hear much in the documentary on the you know who won, who lost that kind of you know view that we a lot of people are still talking about the war. Um, in fact, I uh, heard from a, um, a colleague of mine in Vietnam that the way they conduct the interviews is they ask the people about like so so like you know someone mentioned that the U.S. lost. So what do you think about that? I mean, I, I, uh, I was a little bit surprised when um, I uh, heard that because, you know, like, remember, uh, if you watch the, the very first uh, um, episode uh, when um, the uh, famous novelist Bao Ning said, like, you know, we don't talk about, you know, victory or um, lose or anything. But in fact, that question was asked. Mm -hmm. By the because you know like I heard that they they didn't really um, agree with the way the, the the filmmaker treat the interviews because they didn't they didn't give us any background on like what kind of question they ask but just the answers mm -hmm. and the answer was actually to respond to their questions mm -hmm. on like well so whether we won or we lost that kind of mm -hmm. uh, um, perspective. And then now the, the, when, they, when the, the, the people uh, respond to that kind of question and they say, yeah, well, we don't really talk about that anymore, um, but that, you know, that's how they, they um, frame or they, they put us into that kind of context and think about that. But really, um, we didn't really have that kind of discussion in the series. Yeah. Uh footnote to that. You know, I, I, one thing that struck me is that I don't think any of the, of the, 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 the Vietnamese interviewed North Vietnamese generals, of which there were maybe a dozen or so figures like that. Um, none of them in, engaged in the kind of triumphalist um, uh, language and expression that I heard any number of times in the 80s, 90s on trips to, to mm -hmm. Hanoi. Mm -hmm. yeah. And I don't know if it's, it's, mm -hmm. if it's simply faded away or it's, and if, because I haven't been there now for about a decade, mm -hmm. or, or it, it, it was a function of the selection of individuals to interview. Yeah, I think because, you know, we don't see any um, um, images of historians or experts on the screen. I mean, they, they really go to the house of those veterans, especially interested, I mean, the filmmakers are very interested in the, uh, the, vet, the veterans, the participants of the war. So they, um, and I would say, with the the crew, with all of the machines, the equipments around, and with all of the questions via some two interpreters, um, the Vietnamese, and also in their own way of treating and responding to foreigners, um, I don't think that 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 kind of conception, the 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 uh, the uh, uh, triumphant um, perspective or narratives fitting up. Uh, way uh, they just don't don't give the direct don't, don't don't give the direct answers and also plus the selection of the filmmakers on what they really want to film and what they want to hear in the series and they we just don't hear that part of the story. Uh, what I think is interesting to build off of um, what Huang is saying is um, I think it's it's funny. I mean, I, uh, here we are, a bunch of people who have decided to waste our lives reading books and writing books no one will read. Um, and we are, you know, the, the experts that, that Burns and Novick crew said, we are not going to interview those people, right? Because we are ideological and we claim our ideologies up front, 
right? And so, and that's the mask that they're hiding behind when they say, oh, we're, we're not gonna tell you how to feel. We're just gonna give you this, we're gonna interview both sides, mm -hmm. but all, every single piece of cultural production is mediated, mm -hmm. right? So, um, and uh, the American public, of course, probably hasn't been trained in critical analysis of film and media in, in that kind <laughs> of way, right? They haven't all, they didn't all go home and watch surname, be it given name, nom afterwards and go, oh yes, okay, I understand. Uh, interviews are not just the, the uh, you know, transmission of direct information from this person's mind to my mind. There's, there are movements here and there's power involved, right? And so mm -hmm. I think it's funny the way that they continually disavow that as, I mean, it kind of uh, scarily echoes this anti-intellectual moment, right? Mm -hmm. Where we're not going to talk to experts because they have um, agendas. The American public is not okay with having an agenda, so we're gonna keep telling you that we're neutral, right? We're gonna keep hiding this, um, and it's very much what um, Christoph was saying that um, there there's this unwillingness to kind of unveil this this false promise of neutrality, right? So you use the same tropes, but you keep you try to frame it in a different kind of way, right? You say, well, we we gave you the information, right? And this is as a teacher, I'm always telling students. Um, I have a bias, it's gonna be very obvious to you. Everything in the world has a bias and I'm gonna teach you how to recognize that and then make really good arguments because there's no such thing as anything without bias, right? But somehow they're able to uh, continually make this claim and it's a point of pride for them. Mm -hmm. I think in, in, in that sense that Vietnam television history was more honest because it, it selected uh, very prominent personalities who'd been involved in policy making. And it also interviewed some people like some, just some, you know, folks in the fields who were talking about, you know, the carnage that they had witnessed. And they were identified. I mean, I think one of the dishonest things about uh, the, the, no, uh, the Burns and Novick is that actually it, even people like Browning weren't really identified. I mean, you know, I mean, maybe they said he was a novelist, but it's not really until the end that you find out that these people are really prominent, you know. I mean, there was um, Le Ming Kue and, I mean, most of these Vietnami the Vietnamese that they selected were actually very well-known writers. And they're not just, I mean, and Le Ming Kue is only identified as um, someone who was in the, she was working on the Ho Chi Minh right. Trail in the, in the Ho, yeah, Ho Chi Minh, uh, what do they call those, uh, shop force. Um, you know, she's not identified. identified. Yes, North. right. She's not identified as a writer, and you know, she one of the most prominent. She, she is in the scrolling at the end. I noticed that. <laughs> is she? Oh, well, maybe yeah. the scrolling yeah. on our television is too yeah. small. I, I mean, yeah. I, I just found that quite, quite extraordinary. That, that in, it, it, it's demeaning, really. You know, I mean, this is a very prominent person. Right. Yeah. And they're just an, a North Vietnamese. I'd like to open up um, our discussion to include. Uh, you and the audience, um, if you have uh, questions or comments. My name is Will Allickson. I'm a Vietnam vet and also a member of the Veterans for Peace Chapter 92 in Seattle. I was here in October for that event as well. And uh, the question about why I'm here is, uh, as an activist, I want to learn about as much as I can about things like this and be able to transmit and uh, have meaningful dialogue and perhaps debate with those that might think that uh, this was a good deal and the Burns Novak thing I watched that and uh, there were some of the episodes that I was glad I was watching it being streamed because I was able to pause it and not have to uh, deal with some of the you know it was almost laughable at certain points but uh, thank you all for being here this evening I really appreciate it um, just a couple of simple questions 
Um, I'm sure they would be very simple for this group. Um, do you think it was communism or an attempt to replace the French and exploit natural resources, number one? And uh, I don't know, that's probably yes or no. And then the, uh, the second question is, what if the United States had not become involved in the effort that they became involved in? labor and so on, uh, from a colonized world to uh, Western uh, metropolis is something that is simply not um, available to the, to the viewer, and yet that is a foundational way in which the world functions in the 1940s when uh, the foundations of the labor world are there. I'll take a stab at the second one, I guess, just for the heck of it. I, it that's a perfect example of a counterfactual history. It's something that didn't happen. And so the easy answer, of course, is, well, we don't know and never will. But I think one can make a reasonable guess. Uh, if, say, the French pulled out in 54 and we just sort of said, Psh, okay, we're not going to go there and let what happened, what, what would, that um, within relatively short order, uh, the government in Saigon would have collapsed with a, um, with a push from, from what I call revolutionary, the revolutionary side of revolutionary forces, because in fact it was a mixed bag. The Communist Party very definitely, the, the, the senior partner from the very beginning, which the anti-war movement on the far left in this country didn't admit until late in the war, they were responsible actually for some of the myths that sort of percolated through the country. For, for quite a while and that was one. But coming back to the point, I don't think that the government in Saigon had much of a leg to stand on for reasons which are described in part by the film. You know, the, um, and I know that in recent years there's been a rehabilitation of Mo Ding Ziem. Uh, and uh, some people say, well, you know, if, if we hadn't uh, uh, encouraged his assassination and he'd stayed in power, Oh, yeah. Ziem was, quote, in the words of the narrative, a veteran politician and a Confucian. And it doesn't go much beyond that. It, but it's, there's, there's, there's a subtle acceptance of this notion that, you know, Ziem may have, may have, may have uh, had something. And if we just hadn't pushed him out of power and, given po and, and let the generals take over, incompetent and bumbling as they were, well, you know, Ziem may have pulled his fat out of the fire. No, I don't think that's just, that's, that's the whole line of discussion is just nonsense. So anyway, once in power, the, the Laodong Party, now the Vietnam Communist Party, would have um, uh, probably um, supported its, its allies in Laos. Uh, there would have been a revolutionary war in Laos uh, resulting in a victory for the, the Patet Lao. 
And Prince Sihanouk in Cambodia would have struck a bargain with Hanoi that would have kept him in power, uh, but as, as a kind of a, oh, he would have had to revise his domestic politics a bit to get along with Hanoi, but I think that he could have stayed in power as a figurehead presiding over, a, over a, an autocratic socialist monarchical <laughs> mishmash of a government, which would have been okay with Hanoi because Hanoi, frankly, wasn't anxious to unify Indochina as a single state under its control. It was interested in buffer states. And, and it, with those arrangements, it would have been content. All of this would have scared the bejesus out of the Thai, but they would have survived it because they're a different kind of society. They had a degree uh, of ethnic and national unity that Vietnam, frankly, didn't have, uh, much less any other country in Southeast Asia. Uh, and a revered monarchy, for example, to, to rally around, uh, and so forth. I think that Thai would have, they might have needed a little bit of help from us, but it wouldn't become a military conflict, which eventually it did. And you know why? It wasn't because the communists from across the river invaded the Thai and supported the Thai Communist Party. It was because the United States installed itself in Thailand in order to attack Laos and North Vietnam from Thai territory. Then the Chinese and the North Vietnamese supplied weaponry to the Thai Communist Party. So my conclusion is it wouldn't have been all that big a deal, frankly, to let it go. Well, it would have been a big deal to the Laotians and Cambodians. I, I mean, you know, well, if we're looking at it from a, a, our American perspective, our American grand strategy and so forth. In the fragging and, and yeah. division. But before they even got there, there was a division. You, you know, we had, we had the politicians saying one thing, the general office, uh, officer corps providing statistics that yeah. didn't quite measure up. But before that actually happened, going to Vietnam, hmm. there was a big division. And well, there was a society. There certainly was. There certainly was among my generation of males. I'll tell you that. Yeah. <laughs> well, <laughs> I, I I, I'm part of that. I know. <laughs> yeah. but, so, but, yeah. but within the so army, I, I think was. the obvious answer to your question is yes. yes. <laughs> <laughs> For, yeah. particularly for the officers, you know, company grade yeah. officers and above, uh, certainly the lieutenant colonels and colonels, if they wanted to get the general ranks, they'd better have a, a CIB and yeah. some combat and, ribbons. And, and that may have right. exactly. caused the one-year rotation, yeah. or we yes. never had any stability. I think Marlantes talks about that in the film, and his book is full of it. One, one thing I think your question assumes is that there were, there it was possible to go in and win this war in the first place? Because no, it's... No, I, I, I don't necessarily think that. But certainly going to war that was, I shouldn't say forced, but certainly um, fostered by the politicians with a military that wasn't behind it. It's not the smart Yeah, you're, so you're world. saying it was the recipe for disaster yeah. from the start. Yeah. Can I see my two cents in? Or, sure. I, I know exactly what you're talking about. Uh, uh, I was an engineer officer at, at Fort Knox in 1964 and 65, and, uh, and you know, we lived in the officer housing. Uh, and Fort Knox, of course, was the armor school. And, and uh, all, you know, the whole place, there was just a few engineers there we were you know worked for post engineers and until we got pulled up as a unit and sent to thailand but to build a road to carry the bombs up to the bomb vietnam with but um but uh all of my neighbors were these student officer uh, art, uh armor officers and they were falling all over themselves to get to vietnam they were really disappointed if they didn't get assigned to vietnam um after they finished uh, armor school and, and and all the rest of us mostly who were mostly reserves were saying 
really? <laughs> you know, uh, but just like Les says. Yeah. I think the, uh, the series does actually a pretty good job in uh, talking about the issue of body count. Right, that the, uh, the Westmoreland way of fighting the war was attrition, um, which was itself based on a very uh, uh, false notion of the nature of the war on, uh, in the village level, something that uh, Bill has alluded to, that uh, you could neatly separate uh, a civilian population from the so-called insurgency, and if you just kill enough of those uh, bad guys, so to say, uh, uh, then the war could eventually be, be won. And, and attrition and body count became, in fact, therefore, a career boosting uh, element that, that suffused the whole uh, machinery of war fighting on the American side. And I think that's, uh, that's pretty, uh, pretty well laid out. I think what uh, Hume and Ling uh, pointed to in their comments was that uh, the effect of that on the, particularly on the rural population, uh, of southern Vietnam is really not presented very well. Um, how war tactics, career options, right? I mean, these kind of very tangible things that happen in an organized military, what kind of uh, ripple effects that has on a suffering population in the countryside. And having said that, I think um, the series is not uh, particularly successful in explaining uh, or transcending the old trope of Arvin, Saigon Army, so to say, of Arvin as kind of uh, incompetent, uh, corrupt people that run at the first uh, sound of, of gunfire. Um, uh, because uh, th there is also a, a institutional uh, systematic reason for uh, how the Arvin was set up. It was a, the, the, the only survival that for the Republic in the mid-1950s was to very rapidly militarize it. And therefore, the military in the Saigon government became um, not only a military institution, but a social and political institution for rapid social advancement for the officer corps. And that, uh, that uh, made Arvin a very different fighting machine than, than say, uh, People's Army of Vietnam, the Hanoi uh, counterpart which was held on a very short leash by the party. Made it for very different ways in which armies are fighting and operating. And I think that that, that attention uh, to the kind of institutional background would have also helped us. Um, I want to remind uh, you of um, Lynn's question early on that um, um, we're not only inviting your comments and questions, but also she was actually interested in the reception of the series, how you actually saw the series. What effect did it have on you? And maybe Lynn can re reframe this again, or re rephrase that. Again. Yeah, so, I mean, one, the thing that I walked away with after watching this was, and I'm not saying that they do it successfully, but it felt a lot like they were trying to recuperate veterans. Right, so it felt a lot like they were trying to recuperate them for the American public. And so whether or not you feel that way, I'm interested to see, um, but you know, the constantly repeated theme of reconciliation, and clearly they haven't reconciled with Vietnamese refugees. Clearly they you know, um, haven't really reconciled with the American public, except for the one anti-war protester who feels bad for saying mean things. Right, um, but so uh, as veterans and as as the American public, how do you feel? What do you think the film? What does? How does? How did it resonate with you? Did you feel like it was trying to kind of close the war for you, or did it just leave you asking more questions? Or wh how did you feel? Hi, I'm Mike Diedrich, I'm a Vietnam veteran. Before I answer your question, which I think is a good one, respond a little bit to what some of the other uh, commenters did. I was in basic training in the Army in 1966, and my staff sergeants, platoon sergeants, uh, several of them anyway, who had spent by that time uh, one or two tours in Vietnam, they said, uh, I'm getting the hell out of this man's army, because they didn't see any future to it. Uh, the, uh, for American NCOs, you had to go, either that or get out, and uh, they saw that writing on the wall. 
the uh, other thing is, is for me personally, I, um, I find it difficult to watch, as I think a lot of people did, particularly uh, the veterans, combat veterans, and also for the Vietnamese. They're very uh, tough uh, videos. Um, and I think that um, Burns is really kind of fraudulent in the way he presented the fi film in as much as that, for one thing, there wasn't any uh, uh, audio footage of these combat photographers. As you mentioned earlier, they're shooting pumpkins with AKs. And um, the, uh, a lot of the footage is about combat uh, firefights. And as a sort of point of uh, fact, most of the dead in Vietnam were killed with artillery uh, bombs and rockets. Uh, that's not really mentioned. You think it's all a series of firefights, but it wasn't really. I thought Bill's remark about the uh, the uh, PF and RF uh, forces of, of the uh, NLF, uh, the Arvin forces, were 60%. Their casualties were regional forces or local forces, uh, which is kind of interesting because that's the way the the South Southern revolutionaries operated themselves. It was actually local local forces who did most of the fighting. But I think that one of Burns' points was that he wanted to have this reconciliation. And you can't really, as I understand reconciliation, you can't have reconciliation unless you have an agreement of exactly what happened in the sense of, say, South Africa and their reconciliation. And uh, as some of the commentators from our earlier panel mentioned, they, were, uh, they mentioned this false equivalency. In Vietnam, uh, <coughs> they had two or three million dead. There are something like 300,000 MIA in Vietnam. The entire country, top to bottom, is littered with UXOs. UXOs are ex unexploded ordnance. That would include Laos and Cambodia, too. You know, there's a huge toxic legacy. Uh, a lot of it sits in the bottom of the South China Sea, but also a lot of it sits in the DNA of Vietnamese and uh, other Southeast Asians and, and American veterans. So this sort of, um, you know, these are, these are established facts. Burns had an opportunity to go into this, and as Christoph had mentioned uh, on the earlier panel, he opened some windows, but he didn't go through them. And, uh, you know, as, as far as personally, getting back to personal, I, I'm still, one of the things that has motivated me as, a, as an anti-war veteran is, is this sort of uh, anger the way my government treated me and my fellow veterans and the way they lied to <laughs> Americans generally. And I don't think Burns' um, <coughs> film really goes a long way to establishing that reconciliation. I just mentioned what I'd like to mention to clothing, and, and uh, Christoph mentioned those three veterans that did a lot of the talking they were all members of Vietnam Veterans Against the War at one time or another. So. Thank you. I want to ask, uh, sorry, I'm Joe Hanna. I'm uh, employed here at the UW as an advisor. Formerly, I taught in the geography department, and I did um, my graduate degree work in uh, the politics of Vietnam, both just post-war and um, post-2000. Um, uh, so that's my, my background. I want to pose a what-if question, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to walk around the block to get there. Christoph, uh, you were talking about how the, um, the film relies on old tropes. The film relies on on, it, it doesn't tell us anything new, like they promised they would. There's all these old uh, stereotypes and historical um, readings that we've heard before. They might have repackaged them, there might be new glitz, but we've heard them before. So that's, that's one piece of it. <clears throat> Another piece is um, the, the idea that this film could be unbiased, or it says it's going to be unbiased, uh, but in fact, um, Lynn, you said that it, it's full of bias. Everything we do is full of bias, and I agree with that. Uh, there is no unbiased view, so let's own up to it. But they don't own up to it. 
in effect, by giving us something that we know already, something we've heard so many times since the end of the war over and over and over again, it feels unbiased. But what it's actually doing is confirming a particular form of bias. Okay. So with those thoughts in my mind, and then, um, I'm sorry, I, I don't know your name. Mike. Mike. You're saying that this film did not really resonate as something rec to reconcile veterans. Okay, so what if question. What if this film was not really designed to reconcile with veterans? What if this film was designed to reconcile with the general U.S. population and make them think that we're reconciling with the veterans? Right? What if we're getting people into the comfort zone, oh, this Vietnam thing is behind us, look, Burns and Novick have taken care of the veteran problem for us, we don't have to feel bad about that anymore. Oh, in the Vietnamese we heard, they told us that everything's okay too, okay? So maybe this is not geared toward the veterans, maybe it's geared toward us, the non-veterans. Why? Well, let's go back to something Judas said really early, and it was, <coughs> Oh, I'm gonna I'm gonna mess this up, Judith. I'm sorry. Um, Please go go ahead. <laughs> uh, so, oh, jeez, it flew right out of my head. But so, something about um, the, these kinds of films reflect what's going on in our culture at the time, and this is very different than the than the WBGH film of so many years ago. Well, what's going on in the world in our world at this time? some very interesting ideas about, well, what are our new veterans doing? How are they faring? How are we treating them? What about the longest war in American history? It ain't Vietnam anymore, right? It's the one we're fighting right now. So what if this film is in part a way to come to grips with our current events by trying to pose some ideas about uh, a pseudo reconciliation with prior events? Anyway, this what if thing, talking, hearing all these things and piecing all these things together, this, this makes me think maybe we're reading the film a little bit wrong. Maybe the film is not about Vietnam. Maybe the film is about Afghanistan and Iraq. Mm. What was your name? I'm Joe. Joe, I think I love your comment, which wasn't a question, but because you answered it so well. Um, <laughs> I think, no, I think it's wonderful because it, they do an interview, they, they say we're not going to, um, comment on the war that we're in right now. We, we don't want to tell you, oh yeah, there's resonances. We don't, we're not going to tell you how to feel about this war. And I think it's, it's a way of um, trying to historicize Vietnam as in the past and say to people, time heals all wounds. So we don't need to take care of the veterans coming home now, right? We don't need to take care of our young men um, who are dealing with PTSD, who have been dismembered, because history will be kind to them in 50 years, right? I feel like I agree with what you're saying. I think there's absolutely, um, you know, not intentional, but you know, you can't ignore this historical moment. And you can't, they couldn't have ignored it when they began making the film in 2006, right? Yeah, so thank you for your comment. Yes, thank you, Joe, for clarifying what I uh, meant. <laughs> <laughs> I, you know, I was thinking more about the kind of sensitive, uh, the sensibilities of the moment and the technologies of the moment when I was, um, you know, when I said that. But you're absolutely right that, you know, it goes beyond that. There's a lot going on in the politics of, of today that um, are reflected in this series. Can I just quickly add what, what you're talking about in the previous uh, bill? The, the idea of uh, the current crop of veterans and the issues that surrounding the war. But you know, the terminology that they use to describe you know, all the veterans these days are heroes. They're all warriors. That kind of terminology wasn't around 20 years mm. ago. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's a way to, I think, compensate for perceived slights against Vietnam veterans, which as Kurt, uh, Christoph mentioned, most of that was done by the older vet uh, veterans of World War II and Korea. This is particularly the American Legion of VFW who looked on Vietnam veterans as somebody who were baby killers, pot smokers, drug addicts, and they lost their war. And that, that was, it didn't come from anti-war activists, as Burns uh, uh, actually portrays, including mm -hmm. a very heartfelt apology by somebody who went and said 
hard things to some veteran, you know, I can't believe that, but I mean, that was not the scenario. He actually fraudulently, in my opinion, portrays uh, anti-war veterans as being disrespectable for veterans. It's not, not true at all. I mean, it's, it's really fraudulent. And what I mentioned earlier about uh, the combat scenes, you know, that, that is actually more war porn. It's just war porn. And, and that is a deliberate film trope mm -hmm. to get people to watch it. You know, we don't need any more combat scenes of people getting shot and blown up. You know, that's, that's bullshit. That's been done. It happens constantly throughout the yeah, whole series. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Uh, do we know how much of it is actually just staged? Much of it. They said all of the audio over the yeah, pictures. Yeah. They didn't all have it, any yeah. audio uh, capability in these combat photography. Mm -hmm. <laughs> just, just a cameraman running around yeah. the fire Right. I yeah, think that's I, I, another that's another way where the, this film is much is dishonest in comparison with Vietnam and television history, which did use you know honest to god footage from yeah, well, from, yeah. from you know and press. That's one thing that actually it's one of the only things the military, the United States military, have learned about Vietnam is that you don't let photographers and journalists in the war zone. We don't mm -hmm. have that kind of footage from Iraq. No, absolutely not. Mm -hmm. Me again. Um, I had one, the first, the first episode, uh, I reacted to it much more positively than a lot of the um, uh, comments I've heard from all y'all and at the last episode too. But the reason I reacted to it posit positively was because, because I interpreted it as being totally sarcastic. You know, the, the, the line about uh, uh, good men with good intentions. I thought, really? You gotta be, <laughs> that's a good joke, you know? <laughs> you know, they couldn't, they couldn't really be saying that seriously. But, but, uh, and, but the other thing I think that was a positive thing about the whole series is that, uh, you know, I, I believe Joe mentioned that, you know, that they said a lot of things that, that we all know. Well, yeah, we all know, but, but I think the public as a whole doesn't know that, it doesn't know very much of, of what was in the series. And, and I think people who watch that series are, know a lot more about it than, um, than they did before. And even, even though it, it's, it's pretty soft, it does bring up a lot. There are points in there where they bring up a lot about the lies and, and, uh, and uh, um, otherwise other, other deceptions that, that uh, were going on the whole time. And I, I think they, you know, they didn't do a, a deep expose of all of those things. And maybe I was, maybe I was watching it in, in, um, with the perspective of having just finished reading the, uh, the Best and the Brightest and having a few years earlier read Neil Sheehan's book about uh, uh, Bright and Shining Lie. But um, I, I think overall they put out a lot of information that needed to be put out and, and it just needed to be, now we need to do another. <laughs> 36 or so hours that, <laughs> that expands it into more and more truth. This, this film, like a lot of electronic media going, and, and the more time passes, the more information is freely available. And the quicker the inner workings of government uh, get into our news sources and so forth. And all of this may be serving, be doing us a great disservice precisely because it's revealing what statesmen do. And we're gonna wind up, I'm making a provocative remark here, they're supposed to lie. They're supposed to cheat and steal. They're supposed to wind up killing people and not caring about. That's what statesmanship, that's their job for God's sake, you know? And now we've worked our in, ourselves into this state of mind where we're shocked. Shocked that our statesmen lie? Really? Uh, and with the, 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 the power that we now have through the internet and its ability to, to mobilize public opinion, get people into the streets, we're going to make it impossible to run a coherent foreign policy anymore. That may be one of the results of the Vietnam War and of films like this. Terrible. And all the leaking. <laughs>
I don't completely believe everything I just said, but, but there's, <laughs> as a political science and as a scientist uh, who, whose, whose primary interest is, 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 is in, is in uh, foreign relations and international relations theory and, and so forth, um, I can't help wondering, you know, if there's something there, something new in the water that we need to think about outside of the Vietnam War. I wanted to say something that goes back to actually an earlier question, and that was about natural resources, and to tie it into the questions about kind of cynicism and division within um, uh, the kind of political bodies and the military. And um, it's something that really shocked me when I came across this um, little fact. Uh, when I was working with the um, captured documents from the Vietnam War, which were all the um, the documents that were basically captured from various um, killed enemy and uh, from the Chiu Hoi, the, um, what do we call the Chiu Hoi? Rallyers. Um, that were all microfilmed and, you know, they were used in intelli intelligence. I was working with that collection at, uh, at UMass Boston and I came across this document that really, really shocked me. It was a... Um, an economic um, accounting sheet from a local NLF unit. And you can't possibly imagine what their major source of funding was. Protection money from US um, oil companies. That was their major source of funding. And, you know, that's the cynicism with which, you know, the, the people approach the war. And well, not just the US oil companies, but all of the oil companies were paying, hmm. you know, buying or... It was well known that the rubber plantations, yeah. most of the French yeah, owned, were all doing that. that yes, right. I think actually, I, Doug, heard about the I oil think companies. I think Douglas Pike talks about this actually. Yeah. So it mm -hmm. wasn't new, but it was totally new to me. I just found it completely shocking. You know, especially when you think about people who are, you know, out there mm -hmm. losing their lives for some kind of cause. You know, whatever it be, some anti-communist cause, and, and the cynicism of these. I have another question, particularly to our two Vietnamese Vietnamese Americans here. That, uh, do you think it represented in any sort of tangible or comprehensive way Vietnamese, uh, well, American Vietnamese and Vietnamese uh, points of view? I mean, there were Vietnamese that were interviewed in the film, and, and not very many. Uh, and I didn't really see many Southern revolutionaries mm -hmm. who actually won the war for the South, for the NLF. They were the ones who won. They paid for it. They won. Yeah, I mean, I heard a lot of um, comments from a lot of uh, Vietnamese people, Vietnamese American people, on uh, the kind of uh, limited way or like a very specific way that the film uh, uh, capture um, on the Vietnamese side. Um, a lot of uh, Vietnamese Americans I talked to actually uh, found it a bit. Um, you know, like uh, when you watch the last uh, the last uh, episode of the series, um, they feel it like humiliating, and they feel like a lot of uh, southern Vietnam southern voices wasn't heard at all. Um, also, from um, like about the fact that the war really happened in their own territory, their own country, the part of the country that. Uh, but they they there's a lot. Um, about the the even the the army of the Republic of Vietnam and a lot of different groups in southern part of Vietnam that their voice totally you know didn't exist um, or didn't shown in the uh, wasn't shown in the ha in the film. Um, also, on the other hand, the uh, the voices from the northern part of Vietnam or the other you know the cultural part of uh, the, the uh, you know, the narrator's voice, you know, we, and they use a lot of like we and the enemies, that kind of uh, um, perspectives. Uh, from the other side, um, the uh, point of view, the perspectives of the Northerners or the uh, Democratic Republic of Vietnam wasn't heard as well. Um, there's a lot of, you know, like we, we, we saw some interviews uh, with Bao Ning or Le Minh Khoi or other people. But um, I, I found it even less than the television history 
like the, the interviews or the stories that we, the, the Burns series told, um, we didn't hear uh, a lot of stories from the, um, uh, from the other side or the alternative side. Um, so, and of course, uh, from the historical view, um, we didn't really know what, uh, again, we talk about the post-war uh, controversies and, and we didn't really know much about what really, um, what the Vietnamese people in Vietnam talk about the war after the war. Uh, we don't really know much about that. I mean, we just, I mean, the film opened up a lot of conversations, a lot of different views and, you know, just here now, we are talking about that again, um, but uh, we don't, we, we can't expect like a total view or like a, like a diverse perspectives of the war from the Vietnamese side in this kind of film for American audience and about American history. Yeah, I, don't, I feel like it's, um, it's not a fair question to ask about whether or not a, the side's perspectives are represented in, in, you know, in t totality, right? That's really hard to do. Um, but there are two things that stuck, stuck out to me. Uh, one was, you know, in the last episode, I think they talk about the um, Vietnam embargo for 30 seconds. And then they blame communism for like the economic downturn in post-war Vietnam. Let's talk about what an economic embargo is and what it does, right? They don't talk about that at all. So um, how is the United States responsible in rallying its allies to make sure that Vietnam as a new you know, unified country fails economically, right? That's something. Um, another part of it was there was kind of a, a seemed like orientalized simplicity, right? So you, you see the narratives of the Vietnamese soldiers and you there's the man who he fought in the South and he said, you know, when we went to the re-education camps, they told us it would just be three days. If you were higher up in the army, it would be a month. Um, and he was there for 17 and a half years, right? And he tells his story and he's not angry, he's very measured. And I think that there's a way that it comes off as being, um, you know, this really racialized trope of uh, Vietnamese people as, a different kind of people, like as a different kind of veterans even, right? They can handle the ravages of warfare in ways that the American veterans can't. And so we can talk about PTSD um, here, and even though they talk about, you know, some of the soldiers say, you know, I have nightmares still, I, I have nightmares about the ones who died, I have nightmares about people coming to attack me, the way that it's conveyed is kind of like, oh, look at these people, they're, they're so peaceful and they can deal with the war still in these peaceful kind of ways, because I can tell you if, my, if I asked my dad about his time in the re-education camps, he wouldn't just say, and then it was done, you know? So it's very measured and it has to do with who's, who's doing the asking. Right. That's a really interesting comment be, because uh, Bao Ning was, was known to be a mess uh, when, about mm -hmm. the time he published his book. But he, on, on screen, he's in fine shape. Mm -hmm. well, mm -hmm. You can kind of see through him, but well, he, he's, he's, he, he's, he's stoic and, stoic and mm -hmm. composed yeah. and from beginning to end. Mm -hmm. I kind of disagree. <laughs> I think that Bao Ning is, in fact, uh, very emotional, just under the under surface. Under the surface. It's, yeah, you can, uh, you can see yeah. that in his kind of little uh, flicks of That's his the way head, he talks. Mm -hmm. yeah. That's the way he talk in a way. Uh, but I think, well, but yeah. I think it, it, uh, uh, to me, that, that was an uh, indication of somebody who, who had to keep turmoil in check. Or those are the those are the the, the the portions of the interview with him that Burns and Novak chose to use. We don't know. Yeah, that's right. There's also that scene where um, a, a Vietnamese veteran is being interviewed, and he said, "And and we we looked out and we saw the Americans come and remove their dead and cry." And there's this kind of playing with with emotion. So it's it's not just that you know that that the Vietnamese are portrayed in some um, in some different light, but also that, that, that you know our emotions are being toyed with. That, that oh well, we you know we have this common humanity. But what I find the film is, uh, what I found a bit um, difficult is the they interviews a lot of you know, American vets, a, a lot of, and they talk a lot about like you know up to the 
like in very detail about American soldiers, American presidents, and all that. Uh, but on the other side, uh, the the story on the Vietnamese side is quite on the surface. And they, yeah, they, they can't, you know, I mean, I'm not saying like they have to interview like the same amount of, the number of people or anything like that, but really the, the details, the level of um, reflecting the stories mm -hmm. um, on the Vietnamese side, they never really, they, they couldn't touch uh, on the story um, because, uh, I mean, I understand how hard it is for in for foreigners to interview Vietnamese and get to the point when they really reveal their story and kind of cross the line of like you know emotion and all that and tell you the real story. Um, but still, um, if they if they try, I mean, mm -hmm. also given the 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 political the political context in Vietnam and also within the Vietnamese American society uh, community in the U.S. Um, it's hard to to really uh, film the the true story, you know, with all of the people in the in the room and with like when they talk about all the, all the deep story, what happened to you, you know, in that time. Because even among Vietnamese, they still argue with each other on like really what happened and mm -hmm. you know which side and, and all of that. Mm -hmm. So I mean, it's hard, um, but. So that's why, one, on one hand, I admire their effort to conduct so many interviews and also talking to Vietnamese people. On the other hand, they didn't really, mm. really f complete that, that job. Don't you think it's interesting, actually, that they used Wee Duc, who's somebody who is, um, he wasn't identified either, but he's right. someone who's written a very um, controversial and popular, extensive, history of post-75 Vietnam, very critical of the government, and he's someone who is still, he's, he's free, but he's, you know, it's sort of hard to, to talk to him, you know, he, ha he has to meet you in a, you know, a dark alley somewhere. Um, he's the and only historian that actually appears. Yeah, yes, right. yes, that's right. He's right. a historian. I mean, yes. he's not a real historian. If, they, if you... Well, he's if not officially recognized, right. of course, but, but he's a very interesting character, and the fact that they used him seems to me, actually, a, a kind of stroke of brilliance, I think. That yeah, no, I would say if, if you choose to interview someone to talk about or to look for like a, a somewhat, um, a, 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 you know, an objective stories, then mm -hmm. Duc is a good choice other than, you know, if you ask about the official uh, or orthodox history of, mm -hmm. the, of Vietnam, then uh, like all of the historians in Vietnam would tell you exact one mm -hmm. story. Yeah. So it, it really, you know, it didn't help. So, I mean, if you, if you interview he, he Duc, that's, that's a good mm -hmm. choice, but still he's not really like a, he will not tell you the official history yeah. from the Vietnamese side. On this topic, I think, Hung Yu, your comments about kind of Vietnamese communication style and Vietnamese culture and how it's hard it is to get beyond a certain point and get the truth. I think that's really salient. But I think there's something else going on here, too. Um, when when Bernsonovic interview a Vietnamese, I'm sorry, an um, American vet of the Vietnam War, the audience understands that context. They understand what a Vietnamese vet of the, of the uh, American vet of the Vietnam War is and where they fit in society and <coughs> those kinds of things. But by the very fact that Judith mentioned early that they basically um, erase the identities of most of the Vietnamese that are there. Bao Ning is, is noted by name, but not by who he is. They decontextualize a lot of the Vietnamese speakers. And by decontextualizing, you don't really get the depth of information of the Vietnamese side that we get from the interviews on the American side because we don't know them. They're just, maybe it's part of this Orientalism they're talking about, Lynn. They're, they're, they're the yellow faces, and they're, they're the tokens, but we don't really have that depth and that understanding of where they come from. The kind of emotional complexity. Mm -hmm. I think it is, again, coming back to the, to the very uh, deep line theme of the series, is that Vietnam, the country, the war, did something to America. And that's what we're going to explore, and that's why we have these stories, these long stories that go over several series of that family that is devastated because the young son, under age, 
insists on enlisting. There's resistance by the parents. You know this story, right? And he finally forces his parents to allow him to enlist. And he's all gone whole. He really believes in the, call, in the cause. And then uh, his, um, his letters from the field become more and more dark and uh, depressed. And eventually, he, he, he's dead. And his, uh, his uh, uh, older sister, younger sister, younger sister, um, is one of the witnesses so, over time, and the, the mother too. I mean, there's a whole complexity, and you know, it's a typical kind of Midwestern house, white picket fence. I mean, it's 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 something that any American viewer can relate to. That is, which gives this complexity. Here's something that happened to us, and we want to overcome that. I don't think there's anything of that complexity and depth and emotional. Uh, <coughs> uh, on, on the Vietnamese side. Yeah, no, I totally uh, uh, with you on that. I mean, if we just, we don't really, because it's hard to uh, bring the, the whole new picture or story into the American context. But I mean, if we build up uh, like a, a similar story, or we just follow one case studies mm -hmm. in yeah. Vietnam and yes. do a similar uh, um, mm, reflection on like for example I mean Bao Ning told his story at the end of the uh, film on like he's the only one in the neighborhood who come home um, so for example if we just follow that story I mean and then we can make a like a kind of comparative mm -hmm. views of what really the war did to the people whoever participated in the war and that would be something that would be really a, m more like a new tech than just like a standard view of uh, what we know about the American vets. We do get an extended um, view of, I think it's the, the woman who's a truck driver on the Ho Chi Minh Trail. Isn't, mm -hmm. Doesn't she repeat, isn't that someone who comes back a couple of times? So there's an, there's an extended narrative there. and. And then, you know, we, we're dying to know her husband, too, is, or her fiance, I think, mm -hmm. is also working on the trail. And then we find out at the end that, yes, they are, you know, they both live and they're reunited and they get, they get married. So there is that sort of, you know, continuous narrative of a few of these people on the Vietnamese side. But you're right, there's not the same. Not th to the, the level. Yes, I mean, I mean, as Joe said, too, there's no context to it, really. We can't. We can't understand it in the same way that we yeah. understand the white picket fence. And, yeah. uh, my name is Doug Brown. I'm a veteran of the anti-war movement. And I'd like to ask a question which is potentially unfair but important. Uh, focusing on this film as a cultural event, an artifact. You folks have talked very eloquently about the various elements of it, the emphases, the omissions, the, uh, the, the features and uh, characteristics of it. Uh, and I'd like to push a little harder on a question that Joe asked a little earlier. That is, as you look at this piece of cultural experience and expression, what difference do you see it making to the ongoing cultural conversation? about America's military and foreign policy role in the world. What difference does it make to the way, particularly the people who did not live through this period, experience the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan and future wars that are now being quietly discussed? Maybe Bill addressed that a little bit already. Well, I, I, um, in I'm his cynical. Yes, right. right. I mean, his somewhat cynical view of what well, this this moment in which we're 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 demanding, and in fact, we do know more information about what our. Maybe or maybe we don't. More, but it's, we don't. We know a ton more, I, but I we think, don't know everything. I think that the, the the Vietnam War accounted for a a period of restraint in our foreign policy after it was over uh, and of course most obviously and explicitly in the case of, of Obama him, he and some of the people around him would cite the Vietnam War as mm. the place they learned the lesson that it was it was uh, if we were going to have, have an imperial foreign policy it, it would 
sure be nice to, 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 to execute it through, through local agents instead of doing the fighting ourselves. That, and that sort of goes back to, that's, if there's a lesson that soaked into anybody's brain, I suppose that would be it. But I, it didn't take with everybody who makes our policy. And uh, I won't even try interpreting Trump. I mean, it's, on one hand, he's isolationist, but on the other, he's more interventionist. So we're sort of off to the races there. But sure as heck, what I'm gonna say, there's no reference there to Vietnam whatsoever in his pronouncements or those of the people around him or in the papers they write that, that I've seen or uh, in their behavior. So I think you know, it's all gone. And I have, I had a little piece of data I was gonna use and, uh, oh yeah, here. The Gallup poll, the last time that they polled Americans about their uh, attitudes towards the Vietnam War was in 2000. And I mentioned that already, that back then, 70% uh, of Americans thought that the war was a mistake. But if you took the age 18 to 29 cohort, 27% uh, of those folks thought that the United States had supported North Vietnam. 45% said no, it was the South, and 28% didn't know. And uh, did, uh, asking them whether it was a mistake or not was kind of irrelevant. They, it was, you know. And I, I frankly, I, and I, and of course when I saw that, I was absolutely shocked, but thinking about, hmm, let me see now. Uh, 20, 30 years after the, after the war in Korea was, was <laughs> Was I much different? And so I think that uh, uh, most of the people in this room, anyway, are old enough <coughs> to have lived through the Vietnam War. But uh, when we're gone, I think any impression it made will go with us. The United States is not a country that has much of a memory or learns well. But maybe your larger question about this as a cultural artifact um, is a good one because. You know, I, I, I suspect this, this cultural artifact will live on in a way that, you know, memory of the war doesn't, um, simply because it's Ken Burns. Um, I'm not sure that people are watching Vietnam television history anymore. You can watch it on YouTube, I think, most of it. Watch it. Yeah. Use it yeah, right, you use it still. Um, I'm going to watch it again then. Yeah, but, but I, you know, I think this one probably will have an enduring. Then there's something to be said for it, but precisely because it, it is a kind of a throwback piece, and it's 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 nudging people to 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 uh, believe in the orthodox narrative, which I say has a sort of an anti-war flavor to it on the whole. Uh, and if and if that's the memory that's left in the national consciousness, I for one uh, will, will will be content with that because it's it, it's a uh, the implication is is that you know we did something wrong, and, and uh, war is hell, and war is hell, and all the rest of it, yeah. and you know those those are cautionary notes, and I think that's 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 a good thing. But it also says that if you participate in the invasion of another country, that's a heroic thing. You'd be a hero. Ah. So is it really an anti-war series? With that so little. You know, the term warrior class has crept into yeah. uh, discourse now. Yeah. Not just the warriors, a warrior class. Joe mm -hmm. has an answer. <laughs> I'm sorry, anyway. Not, I have an opinion. I yeah, have please. <laughs> um, but along those lines, when well-meaning people go try with good intentions to rectify things, are, are we talking about America did something wrong or we did it wrongly? We did it in the wrong way. And I got kind of a sense that this narrative about Vietnam is shifting from we didn't do the right thing to we did we had the right intentions, we just failed in our implementation. And that's the scary thing that I think that may be reinforced by film like this. Hmm. Yeah. I just didn't get that out of it. Yeah, it's not what I, I got out of it. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I think it's really an important point because but, but, but a kind of recurring question throughout the series is, the United States didn't win. What could it have done to win? Why didn't it win? Mm -hmm. it, 
never raises the maybe counterfactual question, the question, what if the United States had one? There might still be a half a million soldiers in Vietnam today imposing a police state. Yeah. You know, it might be, be like Korea. Korea. Yeah. Yeah, right. well, what does it mean for the United States to win the war in Vietnam? I can't even conceive of how that could have been good for the end of the war. Iraq or Afghanistan. Yeah. Yeah. So I, what was your name again? Sir? Jim, Jim. Um, um, sorry. Doug. That asked the question, Doug. Doug? Yeah. I, I, this is a, a excellent question, and I'm actually trying to think through this right now. You know, so what is this film as a cultural? Event? But we're we're a particular kind of audience, right? Not everybody watches PBS um, or has these conversations, right? So for us, it's it's something. It's a huge cultural event for a certain class of educated folks, right? Where how does it trickle down? I don't know. I think it's. It's something that I'm trying to think through in, in the circulation. And I think the circulation is where it gains currency and where value, it gets value, it's value, right? Um, so the being on PBS and the ability to now stream it, um, the multiple news outlets who have been writing different articles on it, some very critical takes and some are just um, lauding it, you know, um, as a piece, a masterpiece, right? One way that I try to, um, because obviously I teach about this, right? But I, my entry point is, is, is to teach about immigration and refugees, right? So I think that, and, and to say that the difference that I'm making is for college students is also to say something about the really class status of this conversation, right? Is like the general American public talking about this at all? I doubt it, right? Um, for the one out of 100 American young adults who can afford to go to college or take out loans to go to college, um, they have to be subject to this conversation. So it won't die with you because I'm, I'm here. Um, <laughs> who is here, right? Um, but so th the entry point, I think I wonder because of their distance from the reality of war, right? So I am not very old, right? But I'm, I'm, I'm slightly older than my students and they don't, um, they don't remember historical moments. I asked them, how old were you when 9-11 happened? You know, uh, we are rapidly approaching the age where th our incoming students will be, have been born after that, that event, right? So it doesn't mean anything to them. Um, but there are other entry points that I try to make, right? So I think that immigration is, is huge, right? The re various refugee crises are huge. And I always teach the Vietnam War looking forward to where we are now, right? So if, if the refugees were the unintended consequences of this war and not just uh, evidence of U.S. benevolence, um, then what happens to all of these refugees that we've created in the wars that we're currently engaged in? Right, and so I think that it can be mobilized effectively to teach students. It, I think it's effective as a foundation, right? And so for students who have no entry point, it's beautiful, um, it's easy to watch, um, and then you can give them that, and then you can kind of shatter their illusions later, right? So I think we can use it as an effective teaching tool, but it's about how we contextualize it for them, right? Um, how do you use those tools to help them unpack this this really important political moment, right? And then Judy's comment about finding evidence that, you know, oil companies are backing wars sounds a lot like right now, right? So how many more of these conversations can we generate around um, using the tools that are available to us, right? So that's, it's not perfect. It's not gonna radicalize all of our students to um, protest all of the wars, right? But we can kind of nudge them to question their ideas. And I, and I also think, figure out a way to question this hero narrative without alienating our students because we do have a lot of student veterans who have returned from combat, right? So how do we have these important conversations with them without vilifying them, but vilifying the structures that put them in a position to be in those wars in the first place? And if you veterans have, have uh, good suggestions on how to do that, I'm, I would be very excited to hear what you have to say about that. Well, I think that your context of, of wars and equating that with refugees is, is critical But we just shut them out because they're yeah. Muslim. I mean, that's that's the direct result. You have wars, you have refugees, and it's happened every war. Um, and what are the refugee flows are in fact the intended consequence? It's it's a it's a fact that they happen. You know, 
we have more as you make refugee period. Uh, what was your second about that? Uh, well, so now we also have to, oh, yeah. yeah, deal with this. Well, How do you know, talk uh, about the war and talk about what's wrong with war without these students feeling like they're being vilified? I, uh, right? I had an opportunity to speak with yeah. Washington State has a, a program where they encourage veterans to speak uh, school assemblies. In fact, they require it uh, during uh, for Veterans Day, Armistice Day, as I prefer to call it. But and I spoke at Garfield, and one of the things that I said was, "This is I'm not a hero, and I'm not a warrior. I was a draftee." I went to Vietnam, uh, well, I was kicking and screaming, but I, you know, I didn't want to go there. Um, and I did my duty, I was an interrogator, an analyst, and that sort of thing, but uh, um, I came back quite angry from it, still am really, but I think current crop of veterans, the difference between then and now is that, well, the year I was in Vietnam, there were 16,000 Americans killed. That is unimaginable to most people, most Americans, to think of that. 300 or 400 casualties dead a week. Uh, we've lost in 25 years, going back to the first Gulf War, about 7,000 Americans. And that's that's a huge difference. I mean, that was a half a year's worth of killing in 1968. So that's, but I, I think that everybody in this country, there's so many veterans in this country, everybody across the generation, everybody has a family member or knows a friend who's a veteran or, you know, it's, it's just like we're awash with veterans of all of our wars, really. And for students, and including your veteran students, just having an opportunity to say what they want to say without giving them this sort of, um, you know, you're a hero and a warrior now, you know, uh, thank you for your service, now sit down, I don't want to hear anything more because, frankly, some of these stories that a veteran's going to talk about are, are quite unpleasant. But it's actually a way for them to deal with their experiences. It's an important way. Um, and lastly, one of the things that I, I use, and I encourage everybody, and I think well, veterans would understand this too, is that uh, this thank you for your service is such a trope and a dismissive way of talking to veterans. I, I, uh, I have a friend who's an Iraq veteran, and he said, well, thank you for your service. What do you say? How do you, I said, what if, I, what if I'm a war criminal? Uh, thank you for that service. And, and I, my response to that was, it's an occupational hazard of putting on a uniform, picking up a gun. I would recommend say, welcome home. Thank you for your service is just a bullshit, dismissive way of talking to veterans. And, and you know, treat them with respect by saying, thank you for your service, or thank you, welcome home. You know. But yeah, you know, I don't think you're going to offend any veteran by talking about these issues. You know, I mean, just don't use, don't, don't, just don't call them later. I, I already <laughs> don't. <Yeah. laughs> well, you, you know, with Doug's question about what the, what's the cultural moment, I think, you know, what really, uh, uh, I'm conjecturing here, but what keeps Ken Burns awake at night is a kind of uh, liberal, educated, patriotic pain at the current state of public discourses and divisions in American society. And what he's trying to do in his work and has been doing for 35 years is to recreate American exceptionalism. And that is, you know, a, an idealized uh, version of America that never was, but that uh, American exceptionalism as an ideology talks about all the time. That America is essentially good, that it always is a force for good in the world, and that if things don't go, uh, uh, that way, as we sometimes have to acknowledge, right? Uh, facts matter, and sometimes we do have to acknowledge them. That it is an uh, um, an aberration that needs to be corrected. And I think that's why also Burns and Novick have this kind of dismissiveness about historians, because in many ways we're applying the same kind of vocation. We're storytellers in some ways. But they are storytellers that want to have a resolution. Right? And that whole series is, 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 is coming to that resolution that we, are now, we can now look back, we can reconcile, we can uh, fess up to our mistakes and go back to this kind of idealized community um, of good people. Right? Whereas historians are storytellers that are not particularly interested in resolutions. We are interested in, in fact, or we thrive on 
leaving things ambiguous. And there are multiplicities of truths and voices and narratives um, that can emerge in, in good historical storytelling. Um, so I think there are very different uh, endpoints that Ken Burns uh, and what, what drives Ken Burns and what drives us historians or us academics we're dealing with, with uh, the Vietnam War. I guess it's not only the Ken Burns, but also talking about the Vietnam War in general. I mean, not only uh, the, s the documentaries, but uh, I, uh, I'm kind of like, y y if you guys um, uh, know of the series uh, on the New York Times, mm -hmm. uh, they also got like thousands of comments every day. I mean, uh, for every article they publish. And there's also a lot of different views and uh, also um, I guess is that the we would we can expect the even more um, stories or comments on the documentaries than just those articles on the New York Times. Um, but that that says you know that's a there's still uh, interested people out there uh, and the peop like the people the family of the Vietnam War generation. Um, they are still watching this. Um, so that's still, of course, there's a lot more to do for historians and also not for non-historians uh, to tell the story that maybe in the next 40 years or so, uh, we don't have the chance to listen to those. At least, you know, now with the series, with the documentaries, uh, we still have a chance to interview some a limited number of Vietnam uh, vets or Vietnam participants are, you know, in, in Vietnam. Um, in the next 40 years, we will not have that chance. Well, we've uh, wasted two and a half perfectly fine hours. <laughs> <laughs> I think we might be able, we might be coming to an end right now. I want to uh, once again thank the Southeast Media Center, Shannon Bush in particular, who's um, spent her, her uh, evenings um, organizing and uh, staying around. Um, and I want to uh, thank very much the 